Can you hear me, Professor Fazlur Rahman? Uh, sir, uh, Assalamualaikum. Yes, sir, I can hear you. I can see you. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, we'll start the program, sir. Respected uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Syed Anil Hassan Saab, distinguished uh, historian and author Professor Harbans Nukiaji, Dr. Uh, Danish Moin, head of the Department of History, Mr. Ikramul Haq, the coordinator of the program, uh, this uh, coordinator of the refresher course, my colleague uh, Dr. Jasin Bilgami, and our dear participants, very good morning to you all. And I take this opportunity to, to welcome you all for the inaugural session of this two weeks uh, refresher course in history. This is the first refresher course uh, in history to be organized by uh, our HRDC since its inception in 2007. I'm grateful to my Vice Chancellor for agreeing to raise this occasion. We look forward to your support, sir, to this HRDC. I'm also grateful to Professor Mukia, sir, for accepting the invitation to deliver the inaugural lecture on history's journey, the past, present, and future. Dear participants, as you know, this is a national facility for in service teachers. Uh, in service teachers uh, uh, sponsored by University Grants Commission. Let me brief, uh, brief, give you a brief uh, introduction about my university and HRDC before starting the program, since many of you may be new to this institution. This is a, a national university and also a central university with headquarters at Hyderabad. Uh, very unique feature of this university is that it's a, the mandate of the university is to promote Urdu. Uh, the unique feature is that the, all the courses are offered in Urdu medium. And this university established in 1998, now it is almost 24 years old. Uh, now we have about uh, 19 departments, postgraduate departments, and uh, offering some 82 programs. And we also have a very strong presence in our distance education with uh, a network of uh, 17 regional and sub-regional centers and more than 150 study centers and about the intake of uh, 40,000 students uh, on roles. And we have uh, from diploma to postgraduate uh, PhD programs in different subjects. We have seven schools of study. And, uh, uh, and the university from 1998 to 2021 uh, progressed uh, uh, quite substantially and uh, we are looking forward to uh, grow further, both in terms of qualitative in, in qualitative terms and also in number of programs uh, under the leadership of our new Vice Chancellor, Professor Rainul Hassan. Dear participants, uh, this HRDC is, uh, was established in 2007, and since its inception, we have been trying our best to uh, offer the mandated courses of uh, orientation courses. Now, which is uh, now the, the orientation course is uh, renamed as uh, Faculty Induction Program and refresher courses in both in subjects as well as in interdisciplinary uh, subjects. Uh, and also we have interaction programs for research scholars and uh, uh, programs for the administrative staff of the uh, staff in higher education. And in 2011, uh, this uh, HRDC was uh, uh, ranked 13 among 66 uh, academic staff colleges by National Assessment and Accreditation Council. Uh, so this two weeks refresher course, refresher courses are meant to, you know, update your knowledge in your subject uh, through interactions with uh, eminent scholars and also interactions with your <clears throat> peer group. So this uh, two weeks program, which is commencing from today, 28th September, will be uh, concluding on 11th October. And my colleagues from Department of History designed this program and they have invited the best possible resource person from various higher education institutions for which uh, I'm grateful to Dr. Tanish and also to Ikram Haq for designing this program so well. We'll be having uh, lectures, we'll be having group discussions and we'll be having uh, some uh, participatory learning and also evaluations as mandated by, by UGC. Those details will be provided to you by Dr. Ikramul Haq at the end of this inaugural session. Uh, 
and with this very brief introduction now i request uh, dr danish mohin sir to say few uh, few words to about his department and how he conceived the idea of this uh, uh, schedule of the department uh, program thank you thank you all dr danish thank you very much uh, uh, professor salur rahman uh, honorable vice chancellor sir uh, professor anil hasan sir uh, inaugural speaker of this uh, refresher course professor harman smukhia uh, ugc hrc director professor uh, fazur rahman and my colleague dr ikramul haq the coordinator of this course and dear uh, participant uh, on behalf of the department of history i welcome you all in the uh, in this program uh, before coming to the uh, uh, my introduction of my uh, department i just give a brief uh, I, i must thanks to the vice chancellor for giving this opportunity to spare some time here in this in this program and my thanks is also due to of uh, harman smukhia sir because he has given this opportunity to listen all of us and uh, it was uh, it was uh, his uh, uh, confirmation made us uh, very happy that he is going to be inaugural uh, speaker and uh, my thanks are due to professor fazur rahman because fazur rahman sir is the man who has brought this course to the department of uh, the department of history and in man one probably uh, we are doing for the first time refresher course in history and that too for a new department which was established in 2015 i am coming to my department also and thank you to uh, ikram for uh, conducting uh, for accepting this uh, uh, nomination for this thing uh, for conducting this course uh, uh in uh, as a coordinate uh uh is is as far as uh, department is concerned history as a discipline in the department of uh, in molana azad national river introduced in 2014 as a in a in a regular mode and it was introduced in 2014 as a huge in huge level yeah. as when when ust uh, introduced one course that is uh, that is called ba integrated five three years ba integrated in that history was also one of the paper introduced by the, the department but 2000 full fledged department was established in maulana azad national urdu university with five faculty one professor one assistant professor and three assistant professor and 2015 we uh, we have started our history as uh, in medieval and most of the teacher which were appointed is has a background of medieval indian history or one is also also on medieval or the indian history 2017 the department establish department uh, started its pg program and uh, for the first time we have uh, uh, taken four students in pg program presently we have uh, 10 student enroll in the department of history in phd uh, most of the students they are working on a different uh, different part of the uh, research our specialization is in mainly in medieval india but but one scholar is uh, one uh, faculty is specialized in modern india you know uh, i can just give a brief idea of what we are doing here in in in, in the department of history uh, as a, a research center is concerned, research is concerned our department is uh, research is on diverse field one two students are working on uh, numismatic because i am specialized in medieval numismatics and my area of indus numismatic has been given much importance in, in, in this two students not only this because of uh, uh, the other specialization is gender studies one of my colleague who is working on the gender studies so two students are working on gender studies uh, in modern period uh uh one of my colleague uh, his name is khalid p is is specialized in uh, economic history of south india so he is uh, uh, doing his research and uh, guiding his research in in this area culture history has also been taken by care by all uh, all the faculty because uh, some of the culture topic is also taken care in in, in this research center Uh, uh, uh ikram is one of my colleague he is specialized in intellectual history he is working on On, on the area of uh, uh, Persian uh, historians, uh, particularly this is the area of interest is uh, Persian historian. So he is on uh, intellectual history. Uh, this was about this uh, about my department. But uh, one more thing, we have some uh, 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 these uh, 
I have visualized something for the Department of History. Uh, in future, we have been planning to develop this department as one of the important centers for the numismatics and epigraphy, particularly Arabic and Persian epigraphy. Because Arabic and Persian epigraphy has not been taken care of for the last many years. It has been almost, uh, the position is not good at all. So we are trying to develop this department as one of the important center for the medieval numismatics as well as epigraphy center, medieval medieval area. And another point which I also want to make it here, I, I want to make here, is the other courses which department is going to plan is the some of the courses which is a skill development that we have a plan to develop a travel and tourism courses, museology courses, either it is a full-fledged course or diploma in museology, diploma in travel and tourism courses, diploma in epigraphy, diploma in, uh, in numismatic. That is also a plan of the uh, USP. And numismatic is, uh, numismatics is being taught in most of the part in the ancient Indian history student, but medieval numismatic is hardly being taught in any other university. But this UST is uh, uh, one paper uh, in PG level where numismatic is being taught to the, all, the, all the students. In, it is almost a compulsory paper now uh, for the student of MA. MA. Uh, with this, uh, I, I want to finish my uh, talk and I wish you all the best uh, to all my uh, participants and my colleagues. And, uh, the entire thing is now, uh, entire uh, program is, of course, in the hand of the coordinator. So I wish all the very best to Mr. Ekramul Haq for uh, on this course. And once again, thank you very much, sir, uh, Professor Anil Hassan, sir, for your kind, because your presence uh, uh, makes a lot to us. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ekram, sir, just uh, brief about the program uh, which you have consumed. All right, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Danish uh, Moin, sir. Thank you, um, uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor uh, Anil Hassan Sahab, for coming and joining us today morning. Um, Professor Fazul Rahman Sahab, Director of UGC, HRDC, uh, my colleagues, and dear friends. And of course, Professor Herbas Mukhya is with us today. Um, before I invite the Honorable Vice Chancellor to say a few words, let me tell you something about the program and how we conceive this idea and strategize it. Um, um, although we have not assigned any theme to the refresher course, but we have certainly identified uh, some major areas of thrust. Um, uh, as we all know that the last three decades have witnessed an enormous amount of uh, expansion in historical themes as well as approaches. Um, especially insofar as the history, Indian history is concerned. Uh, so the first major area of thrust, of course, is uh, the historical methodology that has not only transcended the positivistic and empiricist boundary, but has also embraced interdisciplinary approach. Uh, the second uh, is an important shift to the social and cultural history that we all witness. And the third, of course, is the expansion in the source material and new theories of reading the textual and architectural materials. So the idea, briefly speaking, the idea of the program is to have a discussion on such questions and open up an opportunity for scholars of Indian history to get sort of acquainted with the recent developments in the discipline of history and history writing. Uh, uh, so uh, this is, I think, uh, we'll do enough. Uh, and with this, uh, without any further ado, because we all know that the Vice Chancellor is a very, uh, has a very busy schedule, and since he has to go, uh, uh, so I would straight away hand over the mic to the Vulnerable Vice Chancellor, Professor Anderson Sahab, to say a few words. Thank you so much. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Professor Fazlur Rahman, Professor Moeen, Host of participants, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, I'm extremely delighted and excited this morning to see Professor Mukhya in our midst. And this refers to over four decades. My association, long association with Professor Mukhya, and reminds me of my early days of JNU 
as a student. When his book, namely Historians and Historiography, was the most sought after book in, in the entire academia. Now, with the commencement of my teaching career, his theory of mild protest, he developed this theory. I mean, it was really wonderful. Occupied the central stage in the realm of intellectual discussions. And of course, he was first rector in Jain, and his administrative capabilities and qualities as rector JNU has been quite memorable one. I think I can go on talking about Professor Mukhya because, you know, as, as, as I mentioned, is a, uh, we were together in one single campus to be we were, you know, every day somehow we were meeting. And yes, I was also part of the faculty in CHS. I was teaching these students also. So I wish him good health and expect many more footprints in the days to fall. And I welcome him and look forward to listening to his valuable discourses once again. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. You, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now I request uh, Professor Harbans Mukherjee to uh, address the participants. Sir, thank you, sir. Professor Ainlassan Sab. Um, do we still have Professor Mukherjee with us? Because I can't see him. He is there. He is there. Okay. First, yes. Um, yes, I'm there. Uh, you can see me. Probably also yes, hear me. Yes. Now you, yes. there you are. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, dear participants and uh, friends. Um, before I invite Professor Mukhya to deliver the key uh, inaugural address, let me briefly introduce uh, to you all. Professor Havans Mukia, though he needs I no don't need actually, you know, I think uh, doesn't need any introduction. Yeah, but I I must confess <laughs> that I should do this because it is it is a privilege and honor for me yes, to do yes. that. Go ahead. Um okay, um as we all know that Professor Mukia is um a well known historian and public intellectual and uh, I mean, over uh, 60 long years of uh, academic and research career. So Professor Mukhya um, uh, graduated from uh, Kirodimal College, University of Delhi in 1958, and went on to earn his PhD from the same university in 1969. Uh, he wrote his PhD thesis on medieval Indian historiography, later published as the Vice Chancellor has also highlighted. Uh, as historians and historiography during the reign of Akbar that was published in 1976. Uh, he joined the Jawaharlal Nehru University in 1971, uh, soon after the university was established in 1969. Uh, and then Professor Mukhya taught there at the Center for Historical Studies till he retired in 2004. Um, and uh, let me say this because uh, I have heard stories about it that um, along with his colleagues, Professor Mukhya was very instrumental in drafting and framing the curriculum at the Center for Historical Studies uh, and creating uh, the kind of environment of rigorous and innovative research, which um, remained uh, steadfast for a, very long, for a very long period of time. Uh, in 1981, uh, while teaching at JNU a course on feudalism, Professor Mukhya wrote a path-breaking paper titled Was There Feudalism in India? which was published two years later in 1981 uh, in the Journal of Peasant Studies. Now this particular paper created a huge amount of interest 
among scholars working on the socio-economic formation of pre-modern societies across the globe. Because we all know that uh, within the Marxist circle in India during the 60s and 70s, it was pretty much long established uh, thesis that uh, there was feudalism in India. Uh, the very similar kind of feudalism that existed in medieval Europe. Professor Mukhya with this article not only questioned this thesis on the basis of theoretical and empirical ground, but he also challenged the very idea that is the Marxist historian's construction of feudalism as a universal category. From the mid-1980s, uh, mid uh, Professor Mukhya's approach to history writing changed. And I assume, and Professor Mukhya would testify, perhaps after he came in contact with the French historians during his early visits to the School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences, popularly known as EHESS Paris, which is uh, one of the most selective and premier research institutes in the world. And some of the best scholars in the world have been associated with that institute, historians like uh, Fernand Brodel, uh, sociologists like Marcel Moss, and the most recently, Thomas Piketty. During this period, from 1980 to uh, 2003, Professor Mukhya regularly visited, um, probably as a visiting faculty, to the Research Institute in Paris. And uh, between 1988 and 90, he co-edited, and I believe as a result of this interaction with the French historians, he co-edited and translated some 35 um, best articles of the French historians from French into English and published in India in two volumes as French Studies in History. And uh, Professor Mukia has been fellow to a number of uh, national and international university and research institute. Uh, I would just name a few. Uh, he's been visiting, visiting fellow to uh, the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, 1971. As I just mentioned, mentioned he was also a visiting faculty to the EHESS uh, between 1980 to 2003. He was also uh, the visiting faculty, the British Academy, London, in 1993. And he was also a senior fellow to the International Institute of Asian Studies, Leiden, 1997. Professor Mukhya is the founder editor of the Medieval History Journal, published by Sage from New Delhi, London, Los Angeles, Washington, DC, and Singapore. Uh, during his, as I mentioned, during his um, 60 years of um, academic career, teaching, research, and uh, public speaking, uh, Professor Mukhya has authored a number of books in addition to several edited volumes, along with uh, God knows how many articles, research papers, uh, newspaper articles, magazine articles. Um, in 2004, uh, his one of the most creative books, uh, that is The Mughals of India, was published. Uh, and this book stands out uh, because of its very unique approach, which is which Herman Smukia would like to call the annals uh, approach, the, the approach of the annals mm -hmm. historians. In 1993, uh, his book, Perspectives on Medieval History, was published, which is basically a collection of his essays. Similarly, in 2009, uh, Issues in Indian History, Politics and Society was published, which is a collection of his newspaper articles and uh, book reviews. Uh, in 2010, uh, Exploring India's medieval, centu uh, medieval Centuries, Essays in History, Society, Culture and Technology was published. His latest uh, uh, some of his latest edited publications are History of Technology, Volume 2, Medieval India, which was published in 2012, and Understanding India, Indology, and Beyond, uh, which was published in 2012. Now, um, if I can recall correctly, and if I'm wrong, Professor, Professor Mukia can correct me, uh, his most recent article, which was published, I suppose, last year, is about Ab Abul Fazl's idea of reason. Now, I'm reminded of uh, the fact that Professor Mukhya was trained as a historian to read, understand, and interpret texts and medieval historians in the beginning. Now, the life has taken a full circle, I believe. Now, his most recent article, as I said, is about Abu Fazal's idea of reason. So, Professor Mukhya never left that. 
he's still reading them but from a very different standpoint and raising some very different questions with this i should stop here and may i now request professor habans mukhia to unmute and deliver the keynote address thank you so much over to you sir <laughs> well uh <clears throat> first of all i'm very very grateful to you for uh, inviting me to interact with some of the colleagues uh, from you, from your university and colleges uh, i'm delighted that uh, your vice chancellor professor anul hasan who uh, who is so kind to me who has already recollected the more than 40 years of association uh, he was also a colleague actually if i'm not wrong he started his career as a part time teacher of persian in my center center for historical studies and now it's such a delight to see one who started his career as part time teacher in in a center which was not his own center now the vice chancellor of a central university very eminent central university so I'm, it's a great delight to see uh, uh, the recognition of his caliber uh in the in the academic uh, academic institutions so uh, uh thank you very much professor anul hasan for uh, for uh, all the, and i'm i'm delighted that you uh, had studied my book uh, historians and historiography and my notion of uh, silent resistance so closely i'm i'm delighted that uh, uh, you obviously went far beyond your own area persian language and literature and you know engaged in uh, themes which are of no direct concern to you so it's 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 a making of a very eminent intellectual who goes far beyond one's own area and uh, you know engages with uh, disciplines which are not one's own so thank you very much uh, thank you ikram uh, uh, it i'd say it's it has been a you know i'm almost frightened that you that you have done so much of research on me that you know so much about me uh it's really remarkable that uh, it really shows that uh, what a research what a what a what a research scholar you are you are such so deeply committed to finding every to locating every aspect of whatever theme you are researching including a theme like minor theme like Arbans Mukhia. So, thank you very much. I'm very, very uh, not only uh, um, uh, beholden to you, but also delighted to uh, interact with such a, such a, such a, uh, you know, inquisitive, such a wonderful scholar uh, like you. So, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Danish Mohan Sahab, and uh, and and you for inviting me. well i'll need about an hour to uh, almost 10:30 now so i'll need about an hour to speak to say whatever i uh, although what i'm going to say is probably well known to you already but i'm going to put it in some kind of an order in order to make my point uh let me start with i my 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 heading was the topic was history's past present and future uh big topic as you can see let me start with the present rather than the past we'll go to the past a little while later <clears throat> at present what do you understand by history what do we know of history what do we understand by it? when is a historian a historian uh, what does one understand by history what we understand by history is that history uh, is the the primary base of history is facts uh which ha which have to be verified the sources of these facts have to be have to be mentioned has to be have to be identified and the sources themselves have to be critically analyzed and verified and so on and so forth and chronology of the narration of events that we uh, we do we engage in history uh, that chronology is extremely important in order to as a as a kind of verification of the facts so you know history is a, a kind of uh, narration of the of the past uh, in a way abul fazl uh, 
and uh, ikram you were right uh, that's my last article uh, i published on abul fazal let me also say that you know when you mentioned my uh, chal- sort of challenge to uh, uh, the notion of indian feudalism uh, you mentioned that it was a challenge to marxist historians which it was marxist is a great marxist historian like professor sharma but let me also say that i was also a very committed marxist when i did that you know uh, so which really shows that marxist is not one you know there are various kinds of marxist historians various kinds of marxism and marxist historians do engage in very very uh, uh, almost very challenging kind of uh, engagements with one another you know which is which is a which is which is a demonstration of the richness of marxism you know rather than its poverty so uh, that's just by the way since you since you mentioned that i was challenging marxist historians i just wanted to say that i wasn't challenging uh, you know marxist historian as a as a as a non marxist or anti marxist but that's just by the way sorry to go into that yeah so uh, so so this is what we deal with history this is what history is history is collection of facts uh, Yeah, I was saying Abul Fazl that took me away to to Abul Fazl in a way defines history very beautifully. He says uh, uh, almost anticipating uh, Leopold von Ranke. He says his what is history? He says history is the narration of the fact narration of ev- history is a narration of events of the world in a chronological order. Very simple narration. of events of the world in a chronological order you know uh, uh, now uh, history is virtually that you see uh, history that we practice today is virtually that you know? now that's a present more or less a present there are many other aspects to it we'll come to that but uh, it it it's sort it's sort of the shall we say take off point you know the starting point of history is is uh, is the narration of facts in a chrono- verified facts in a chronological order etc uh, etc et events of the world in a chronological order verified events of the world from verified sources and so on now uh, what is the past of history was it always like this that we present today uh it wasn't always like this you know it in fact it's a, it's a very fascinating past it has gone through various kinds of mutations combinations and changes and mutations and so on and so forth let's start from the beginning we usually start the from the beginning uh with herodotus uh 6 century bc 5th century bc uh herodot herodotus is supposed to be kind of father of history and so on and we also claim that history is the oldest sort of discipline all other disciplines are offshoots of history uh there's just to build up our, build up our pride in the, in the discipline you know it's actually not so old anyway but anyway what is history uh, herodotus book is called histories it's not history it is histories and therefore uh, the very title of the book is indicates that there is not one history of one region there are all kinds of histories of all kinds of regions he deals he deals mainly with european uh, history and and persia and so on but uh, he is he the very title of his book is indicative of the existence of not one history or one kind of history but many or, or rather not one history but many histories the plurality of history that's the starting point as it were but then what did, what would history mean to him or histories mean to him he mentions in his histories what he has done is he has collected tales and traditions uh tales and traditions it what constitutes history for him not facts of history and certainly not verified verified facts of history but what he has heard as tales and tradition and tales are, and traditions are by by their very nature they are not uh, they are not verifiable you know uh, so that we start with a kind of narration of tales and traditions rather than of facts of history 
It does narrate facts, but we don't know whether these facts are true or not because there is no way of checking. He didn't check and there is no way of checking. There is no corroborative evidence of any kind whether these facts are correct or not or authentic or not. But that's what he has given us. But what's important to note, nonetheless, Herodotus and, and his other uh, uh, contemporaries and later Greek historians, what is important to note is that the explanation that uh, these Greek historians from Herodotus onwards gave was a, a rational explanation to, uh, to historical, whatever historical events that, that they narrated, traditions or, or what they what they thought were traditions, etc., etc. Uh, the, there is a rational explanation. You know, there is no uh, divine explanation. There is no God is not uh, God is not invoked to explain historical events that they are narrating. So that rationality is the high high water mark of this kind of histories that of the kind of history or histories that were given to us by, by the by antiquity by uh, centuries bc onwards then came a major transformation in the medieval european context the transformation came with the uh, saint augustine particularly with his city of god the there are two transformations that came two twofold transformation that came one was <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. One was that history now became a singular rather than plural that Herodotus had spoken of. All history becomes one history. And why does all history become one history? Because, because of the second change that, that had come about. Namely that uh, all history has one explanation not various explanations for various events, only one explanation, namely God's will. God had willed. So there is a uh, providential intervention, divine intervention in the explanation of God's will. So twofold uh, transformation. One, all history becomes one unit, universal history. History means universal history, history of the entire, uh, entire, entire world is one single history. There are no different histories. You know. And and it has a single pattern. And why does it have a single pattern? Why is it one history? It is because it all history occurs because of divine will. All events occur, happen because of divine will. Now, in God's will, what has happened in the past is known to him. What, has hap what is happening today is known to him. What is going to happen tomorrow is known to him. So nothing is nothing is uh, haphazard in God's will, you know. Uh, and therefore, what has happened in the past, what is happening today, what is going to happen is part of one single pattern, you know, uh, which is and therefore history becomes the unfolding of God's will, single and a single explanation is given to a single uh, uh, discipline or well, discipline is the wrong word, to single uh, uh, whatever, uh, I don't know what, what other word to use. Uh, to, so, to single explanation for history, uh, which is one single unit, you know, one single pattern, uh, which is unfolding God's will. So that was a major transformation uh, that uh, took place in the medieval world. And in a way, uh, uh, it's very fascinating that uh, I find it very fascinating that this this twofold uh, phenomenon of uh, uh, transformation of history from uh, from Herodotus to Saint Augustine, <coughs> in a way, still remains with us. You know. How does it remain with us? Uh, look at uh, look at. Uh, uh, Positivism, for example, later on. I'll come to it in a moment, but let me uh, stop here for a uh, divert here for a moment. Look at positivism. Look at Marxism, for example. Uh, look at Hegel's uh, uh, view of history. All history is universal history there. Marxism, all history is the history of class struggle. So 
they are all thinking of history as a singularity, as a single unit, rather than histories as Herodotus had thought of. This is one aspect that St. Augustine has given us, namely, uh, all history is one single unit, which continues right into positivism and even Marxism. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, 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 theology can't have a more stern uh, uh, adversary than Marxism, and yet Marxism inherits one the singularity of history as a uh, as a as a as a single unit, and b single explanation of history in 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 uh, Saint Augustine time. Saint Augustine's mind, it was divine will. In in Marx's mind, it is class struggle. So, but there is only one explanation of history. History as all histories, as history of class struggle, uh, wrote Marx and Engels, uh, which later Engels changed to all histories, as, all written histories, as history of class struggle. Anyway, that's a minor thing. Now, uh, so so uh, uh, Saint Augustine changed the very very uh, discipline, if you like. Discipline, again, because it, as a discipline, it develops much later. So I'm hesitant to use the word discipline for, for it uh, in the medieval context. But uh, let's say dip discipline within quotation marks. He changed that discipline altogether. Uh, then came uh, Renaissance, which invoked the ancient rationality uh, which uh, pro took, created the self-image of reason, rationality, modernity, uh, and counterposed it to the image that it created of the past, of its own past, namely the image of dark ages, the a dark age of superstition, which was equated with religion and religiosity of every kind. So a counterposition between rationality on one hand uh, and religion and religiosity, on the other hand, rationality is uh, modern, re, re, uh, medieval is dark ages, medieval uh, religion, re, religiosity, dark ages, and so on and so forth. So a counterposition was created by, uh, after Renaissance, uh, a counterposition between rationality and uh, religion and relig religiosity, between modernity modern and uh, medieval uh, and between uh, uh, between the rational and the dark ages and so on and so forth. You know. The counterposition came which evo invoked rationality of the of ancient uh, of antiquity in Europe. Now uh, but it went beyond uh, this counterposition. Something else also developed. Namely uh, uh, you know, this was the time when uh, two two developments were taking place. One was that uh, Roman law was coming back uh, into use. Uh, Roman law as com as opposed to uh, customary law. You know. <coughs> customary law obviously has many many variations. Customary law. Uh, Differs from each locality to, uh, from each locality to the next locality. Differs from each community to another community. But Roman law was more universal. But Roman law ha had not been codified till then. Roman law was also it was known as Ro Roman law, just as the British Constitution is known as a British Constitution. But there is no such book as there is no such thing as a British Constitution. You know? So, so. Something along those lines, uh, Roman law was operative, and yet it had not been codified. So some, sometime around the 16th century, uh, one need was to codify Ro Roman law as a rational kind of uh, rational, uh, uh, rational guide to one's behavior and so, so society, uh, organizing society. So, uh, and then they found uh, that Roman law is not just one law. There are many kinds of interpretations of law, law, Roman law. And these interpretations were different because the context of each interpretation was different. So the notion of context of a, 
of a, a phenomenon began to arise. You, you do, you, nothing is permanent, nothing is eternal. You see things in their context. So, historic, so gradually, uh, well, we'll come to that in a moment. So, so the notion of context began to arise. And the second was the, the development of language, linguistics, understanding the meaning of words, the changing meaning of words. The, mean, the words have a habit of changing uh, their meaning all the time. You know? So how do the meanings change? Why do the meanings change? What brings, such, um, brings about the changes in the meaning of words, etc.? So in a way, two critical elements of what would become the discipline of history began to emerge, namely the, uh, the notion of context began to emerge and therefore the events that we are narrating or the events that we are investigating and narrating had to be seen in a context and b that uh, their their meanings had to be their meanings had to be understood their changing meaning uh, constantly metam metamorphosed in different contexts that had to be understood that, of course, follows from the context in a way. You know. So that uh, you begin to uh, uh, you begin to look at events critically. You know, uh, what uh, St. Augustine had done was there was no critical element. God said, God has built everything to happen, so it happens. Uh, there is no, there is, you, you, how do you know whether what you are narrating is true or not? Well, uh, uh, very respectable people have told us, you know, uh, you, you, there is no way to check, there is no need to check the authenticity of veracity of these events because very respectable, respected people have narrated these events. So that's it, you know. So the, the, the notion of checking the veracity of events is a much later notion which, which is alien to say St. Augustine's concept which comes much later with all these developments that I'm talk, talking about. You know. And by the late, by the later 16th century and 17th century, uh, two French historians, uh, by, the, by, by now we can call them historians, uh, uh, Francois, Francois Baudouin and uh, Jean Baudin, they developed the notion of sources, primary and secondary sources, you know, something we take for granted, that there are different kinds of sources, primary sources and secondary sources. And primary sources have a primacy over secondary sources. And they define primary sources exactly as we understand them, namely sources which narrate an event, which are close to the events that they are narrated, close to the events in time that they are narrating. These are the primary sources. The secondary sources are those which are long way away in time from uh, from the events that they're narrating, exactly as we understood. This developed sometime in the late 16th and early 17th century. And that uh, uh, by, and, the, and, the, and the notion of chronology began to de develop in the 17th century, late 16th, 17th century. You know. And the third development that took place was that archives began to be preserved. Uh, archives began to be preserved, which enabled historians to check the veracity of events you know, from the sources, primary and secondary sources. And the greatest, the most fascinating archive in Europe is the church archives. You know. The church has such, it's such a marvelous source of information about every kind of social of growing population. Uh, rituals, uh, inheritance, uh, succession, uh, marriage, divorce, every kind, death, uh, changing attitudes towards that. There are several books in, in, in French on the how the attitudes towards, the, uh, towards death kept in changing over time. You know? All of these are these, these the, the information comes from the church archives. So that uh, archives and then family archives and municipal archives and so on and so forth, these began to be uh, to be preserved. And therefore, a notion of 
uh, verifying uh, uh, facts, uh, notion of verifying the events that they are uh, veracity of events that uh, notion of checking the veracity of events that you are narrating with reference to the primary sources, secondary sources, chronology, time, etc., etc., had developed by the 17th century. And towards the end of the 17th century, 1688, to be precise, although it had started developing earlier, uh, uh, the, the notion of periodization came along in Europe. Period, I have, in a way, hinted at it, the periodization of ancient, medieval, and modern. It, the periodization arose not in a succession of ancient, medieval, and modern. It arose in a reverse order. Namely, first they defined the modern, modernity and modern period. Modernity is, and modern period begins with the rise of rationality, which is post-Renaissance and so on. And then they defined what is medieval. Medieval is not an entity in itself. Medieval is what, the, what modern is not. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the other of modern, actually. You know, uh, so that, and then they went back to ancient, uh, to, to which they had tried to invoke for their modern, for their modernity, and uh, and and so on. So that the notion of periodization uh, developed six, by by 1688. It was formalized. What does uh, what does periodization imply? It implies a the modern scientific rational period, which begins at a certain point. Uh, earlier period is backward, the, uh, backward, uh, uh, dark ages as they called it. Uh, earlier that was the medieval period in Europe, and then gradually this as this. Uh, as this uh, periodization spread to the rest of the world uh, by the 19th century, at the, towards the end of the 19th century, it, uh, as Europe expanded to the rest of the world, its concepts also, not only its, its, its arms and its economy and its politics uh, uh, spread to the rest of the world, but also its concepts spread to the world, including the concept of periodization, ancient, medieval, and modern. So what did it imply for the rest of the world? What it implied was that Europe was the modern period. Europe was the modern, uh, uh, embodied the modern period, modernity, rationality. The rest of the world was still lying in the medieval dark ages. And therefore, it becomes the duty of, the, of Europe to bring the rest of the world to, into an era of rationality and modernity and so on and so forth. You know, the, 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 the civil, what's called civilized man's burden. You know. uh, so that uh, the periodization had this grave implication of not only, uh, uh, not only uh, creating an image of their own past to begin with as a period of utter backwardness, darkness, irrationality, superstition. But the rest of the world was created in the same image as the notion spread to the rest of the world. You know? And therefore, uh, as I said, the world, the Europe must uh, rescue the rest of the world from its irrationality, from its uh, backwardness, from its dark ages, and so on and so forth. But it came in the 17th century in the context of Europe to begin with. Uh, now, uh, by 18th century, uh, very major sort of mega concepts were beginning to grow. Concepts of civilization, concept of rationality, concept of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, periodization, as I said very big concepts which covered vast sort of vast uh, uh, themes, not small areas and small themes, but very vast themes. The, but uh, by late 18th century, 19th century, all, all a kind of a kind of reaction to it, to, to the mega concept concept of uh, uh, of uh, the so-called rationality and so on, mega concept 
began to reaction to these mega concepts began to develop. Uh, Gibbon was a, virtually the first one who who talk, who talked of history at its ground level, you know, not in a very mega concept construction, but its ground level, you know. And this was taken to its highest point by Leopold von Ranke. Leopold von Ranke, whose famous statement uh, in seven English words, probably five German words, but maybe seven or so English words. History tells us as it actually, as it really happened. It's a very, it's a very uh, powerful, it's an encompassing, it's a, it's a very phenomenally powerful uh, seven words in English. History tells us as it actually happened or is, as it really happened, actually or really. That's a translation, so one, one or the other. As it actually, what is so fascinating about it? He had written his book uh, in 1924. He had written a book, uh, uh, Platonic and uh, Platonic and some civilization. I, I forget. Uh, let, let me just check. Uh, yeah, one one book, uh, Latin and Platonic civilization. Yes. Uh, he he in that in, it is in the it is in the uh, it's in the uh, preface to that book uh, introduction to that book that he says i have avoided all in, invention i have avoided all imagination i have told facts as they actually happened or as they really happened you know? from this uh, preface of his more than the book the preface of his book the phrase became common as it History tells us as it really happened. Why? How does? It's interesting that he is not saying his historian tells us as it really happened. Uh, uh, he historian can be wrong. Historian can be ill-informed. Uh, historian, all historians can be at any point of time can be wrong. So it's not historians who tell us as it really happened. It's history which tells us as it really happened. How does history tell us? as it really happened. The first emphasis is on the history, on history. History tells us as it really happened. How does history tell us as it really happened? Uh, today, as Ranke had done his, in his book, uh, uh, just go on collecting facts. Don't go, don't imagine anything, don't invent it. These are his words, imagine and invent. Don't imagine anything, don't invent anything. Just go on collecting facts. Just go on. Historians, all historians' job is to go on collecting facts. One day will come when all the facts of history will have been collected. And then that is the day when history will tell us as it really happened. History will tell us History will tell, not historian, because all the all history would have been collected someday. All the facts of history will have been. It didn't occur to uh, Ranke that when all the facts of history have been collected, then history would come to an end. You know, there will be nothing. So it's a kind of <laughs> self-destruct kind of project. You know, uh, there will be nothing left for the historian to do. Now I'm not talking of historians' jobs, you know, but discipline of history will come to an end, you know, when all the facts of history have been collected. But anyway, that's one emphasis. History will tell us as it really happened. And the second emphasis, more important emphasis, even more important emphasis is history will tell us as it really happened. The reality of it is, is very, very, just like in sciences, you know, physics, physics, physics uh, scholar tells you exactly or space uh, uh, scholar of space tells you uh, what is the exact distance between the sun and the moon or between the earth and the moon you know and how to reach there and how, at what speed can you uh, land there etc etc exactly you know uh, or a chemist kit so also in the in history will tell you exactly that there will be no ambiguity about what history tells you. you see, uh, there will be no doubt about what history tells you. It will tell you as exactly as as it really happened. Yeah, the, 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 the reality of it is is the most important element of it. So just like in so this is the time when positivism had started flowing down from the natural sciences to the social sciences. 
sociology had just come into existence. Sociology, August Comte, the, the founder of sociology, thought that sociology is the most exact science. It is the most precise science. And mathematics, he thought, was the least precise, least reliable, because there is no objective reality of maths. You know, maths is the, all the figures of maths are imagined by us human beings. You know, so there is no objective reality of maths, and therefore, uh, you know, today, if two, if we imagine that two and two make four, uh, tomorrow, if we uh, had imagined that two and two make six, then the four would would become six. You know, uh, so there is no objective basis of, according to him, maths. Uh, sociology has that objective basis, you know, according to him, and therefore it can predict precisely how society will function, just as a physics uh, uh, professor can tell you how exactly uh, whatever uh, you know has to be done uh, in physics in in, in uh, on on the, on the ground. So that this notion of exactness of science, natural sciences, is coming down to the social sciences. Political science is a science. Uh, history is a science. Uh, it's still called a science in many. There is a one, one, one uh, organization, uh, world organization, I think it's called World Congress of Con Congress or Conference of Historical Sciences. You know, uh, uh, so that uh, 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 social sciences, all of these are social sciences that we that faculties of social sciences. So the notion of science was coming down to the to the to, to the, these disciplines. You know, and the assumption that we follow the same method, same exact methods. So that was the point of uh, of uh, Ranke uh, making the statement that nothing, sorry, uh, history tells us as it really happened. Uh, now, uh, does history really tell us as it really happened? Can it really, can it really tell us as it really happened? Uh, it can never tell, apart from the fact that lots of history gets destroyed all the time, has been destroyed, keeps getting destroyed all the time, you know. But in any case, uh, history, the knowledge of history will never come to the, the knowledge of anything never reaches a terminal point, you know. Knowledge, any knowledge grows through self-questioning, questioning the received knowledge, and then you go further. So any history that you learn or any form of knowledge that you narrate gets questioned and then it advances further. It never reaches a terminal point. But anyway, uh, the uh, this but this was the this was the, this was uh, Ranke's uh, uh, formulation. History tells us has really happened, which pervaded the whole world of history. By the, by now, history had become in the 19th century, particularly uh, 18th century onward, but 19th century uh, particularly, history had become a fully fledged discipline in the sense that it had it had uh, in Berlin University there was a department of history where training uh, was given in in history as it is now. So by then, history had developed into a into a discipline, fully fledged discipline. You know. Now, and this Rankian pro proposition, history is the collection of facts. Uh, facts are sacred; opinions are free, as there used to be said. You know. Uh, so, now what does it imply? Facts are sacred; opinions are free. Collect facts; don't judge them; don't interpret them. Just facts. What does it imply? It implies that facts are objective facts. There can be no doubt about. There is no subjectivity in these in the facts which have been recorded in the archives. Where are these facts? They are all there in the archives. How do you recover them? Go to the archives and collect them, and go on collecting them. These are all objective facts. There is no subjectivity in these facts. You know? uh, that's one very, very, uh, very, very important aspect of this notion of uh, history tells us as it really happened. And the second aspect is that if you go collect facts uh, from the archives, 
what kind of facts are there in the archives you know usually apart from church archives and so on which is specific specific to europe particularly uh, usually the facts are that are recorded in the archives are facts of kings and queens and princes and their wars and battles and administration and so on and so forth or family family uh, struggles and so on and so forth these are the administration uh, and so on these are the facts you know facts which are recorded so therefore when you are collecting these facts all you are doing is collecting facts of uh, facts about uh, about Uh, dynastic history about kings queens their administration battles and so on and so forth history is extremely limited then limited as it was actually for a very long time under the influence of uh, ranke it was uh, limited to uh, to uh... now let me let me just uh, take a break here from this and we'll come back to it you know i've been talking about europe all the time but you know uh, there are other traditions uh, which uh, are al- also very well developed traditions china for example has a very uh, strict notion of chronology of events chronology is very important because chronology gives you the authenticates an event you know? this event happened in this particular year here uh here it happened in this particular year there is a, a mode of authentication of that uh, of the event but even more important is the islamic uh, arab islamic uh, notion of history uh tarif khalidi the the arab historian has put it very beautifully islam not only gave a new religion to humanity also a new concept of history prior to islam there was no concept of history in fact in arabic or in persian or in uh, urdu for that matter history is tarikh and his and tawa- his tarikh is date and history they are the they are synonymous in a way and tawa- tawarikh is, uh, is you know uh, plural of tarikh so history history was given history came as a uh, along with the notion of along with the history came uh, with islam along with the notion of chronology uh, so that uh, chronology it gives you uh, as i said uh, uh, a, a a mode of authenticating uh, the event the, and in particularly in uh, islam uh, in arabic and uh, in in the derivative 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 languages persian and urdu not in urdu so much although it can be done uh, the abjad you know abjad is the uh, uh, numerical value of the letters each letter has a numerical value alif has one b b has two and so on and so forth and the last letter has 900 you know. so each letter has a numerical value and abjad is uh, con- co- co- coining a term or coining a phrase or coining a verse the uh, the uh, numerical value of which will be equal to the the date of that event you know? uh, uh, like uh, you often see uh, 786 written behind the behind the three wheeler you know uh, 786 is the numerical value of bismillah or rahman or rahim so instead of writing bismillah or rahman you just write 786 which is the numerical value of bismillah you know similarly you coin a phrase or a verse to uh, to reaffirm the uh, chronological event chrono- chronology of an event chronological location of event which you are narrating you know? and this happened very very often so that the notion of chronology is very significant part of right from the beginning part of uh, uh, the the history the concept of history that islam brought to the to to not only the muslim world but uh, other parts of and the second is uh, isnad isnad is uh, though it is specifically related to uh, hawadis the hadith to tracing the authenticity of the hadith 
but it it is the concept of uh, authentic authenticating is still there it, it is applicable to history as well isnad is you get your information about an event from a you take it from a then you go to b it is sorry then you check where did a get his information from you a got his information from b his or her information from b so you go and check with b whether the information that a is narrating is correct or not and you you check it uh, compare it with that then you find out you ask b you check with b where did b get his or her information from b got it from c so you go and check with c now uh, and until you reach the original source of that uh, event or that narrative or that whatever phenomenon uh, when you when you reach the original source of it only then you find you, then you are satisfied that it was uh, it was authentic so that you are checking at every step now this is as i said mostly related to uh, hadith to checking the authentic authenticity of hadith but it is as as much but the notion of checking was important you know uh, uh, whether it was applied to history or not the notion so that uh, or uh, i was talking of archives uh, uh, developing in the late 16th 17th century in europe you know think of uh, Abul Fazl writing his Akbar Nama and particularly his Aine Akbari without an archive is it possible at all? Uh, he had a, an archives had been put up had been organized for Abul Fazl by Akbar for Abul Fazl to write uh, his Akbar Nama and Aine Akbari and so on and so forth. So the concept of archives is already in existence. Uh, in other areas other than europe you know so it's it's not as if europe when it brought this ancient medieval and modern to the rest of the world it not at by its intellectual superiority but by the force of its relations of power it had the power to to impose these uh, its own concept of history its own concept of time its own concept of chronology its own dates of chronology bc and ad now it is bce and ce but the but that's only the change of terms the fact remains the same it is still bc and ad and therefore uh, the other modes of history which were also were very well developed uh, were suppressed by uh, in fact jack goody has a delightful book called the theft of history you know how uh, the other notions of history other notions of time and space and history and events and narration and so on and so forth all uh, and coin chronology of course all of these notions which were prevalent in the rest of the world and they are diverse notions all of these were stolen from the rest of the world and theft of history as he calls it and only one notion was imposed namely rankian notion and rank and one notion of chronology lame the bc and ad was imposed and only more, one mode of uh, studying history was imposed uh, by the by the rankian notion you know so that uh, uh, this theft of history uh, was was is still a very very uh, powerful <laughs> presence <laughs> is a very powerful presence in the academic world around the world uh, so let me let me go back to europe now uh, uh, well uh, ranke had a had a great influence still has a great influence uh, but then things began to change uh, uh, particularly with the coming of anal historiography anal mode of history writing uh, an all mode of history writing uh, introduced couple of couple of uh, dimensions to rankian notion of of uh, fact one uh, and and history one facts recorded in the archives are not objective facts they are also uh, in fact uh, as mark broke i think called said it 
all facts are psychological facts. By psychological facts, he did not mean that they are imagined by uh, people through their different psychologies and so on and so forth. That was obviously not the mean, or that all facts are purely psychological facts or imaginary facts, etc., etc. But what he meant was that when an event takes place and somebody is recording it, it's somebody who is recording it, you know. In that body who is recording, that somebody who is recording it has his own, his or her own understanding of that fact which is being recorded you know, and it's being placed in the archives. And when a third person, you and I, go and check that fact, those facts, we have our own understanding of those facts which have already been, in a way, uh, well, not colored really, but which, which have a dimension psychological dimension of the recorder of those facts which already has that di dimension or an understanding of those facts uh, and we are constructing a, even a third understanding or second or third understanding of that fact which is different from the understanding of the recorder of that fact so every time you go to a fact it changes the fact itself changes in the sense that its meaning changes so there is no objective facts as such. All facts are in a way, uh, in a way, uh, malleable facts, uh, uh, ambivalent facts. They are, don't speak only one language. They speak many languages. They speak. They are uh, polyvocal facts. So that that's one. Uh, so that you, in order to understand facts, you have to use imagination. Uh, Ramke had ruled out imagination completely and he, he called it invention. Uh, but they are bringing it, the anal historians bringing in imagination back into the, in order to understand the meaning of those facts. You, know, you need imagination. You have to imagine what these could have meant, etc., etc., to me. So you have to understand the historian uh, who is recorded or the First person who has recorded the fact or the historian who has recorded the fact, you have to understand the historian and then you have to understand, you have to imagine the understanding of the historian of the of those facts and then you have to understand, imagine the meaning uh, of those facts which he has put in and you uh, are de deriving. So imagination uh, plays a very important point in reconstructing uh, uh, and therefore, there is a kind of transition here from certitude, positivism, Rankeism, Ranke, Ranke gave you a certitude. These are facts. Uh, they are unalterable. They are. Uh, they are. Uh, they speak only one language. Uh, Anal historiography said they speak many languages, and therefore they are from. We move from a certitude, which is also true of Marxism certitude there is an objective reality which a historian must try to reconstruct through imagine through uh, accumulation of knowledge until you reach that objective reality your subjective understanding so a dichotomy is being created objective reality and a subjective understanding your subjective understanding is passe is defective uh, but the objective reality is objective. It can't change. And therefore, your understanding must keep on changing until you reach that objective reality. And once you reach that objective reality, that reality, you have captured that, encapsulated that reality. That cannot change. And all historical historians keep us telling us they are, all of these are constantly changing. They are, and they have not one meaning. They are not objective or in the sense of having one meaning. They have many meanings. They are polyvalent rather than uh, having a single meaning. The third uh, dimension that the second or third dimension that they introduced was that, you know, uh, positivism, but particularly Marxism. Marxism is a variant of positivism. It's not the same as positive. You know, the basic difference between Marxism, positivism and Marxism is that for positivism, facts uh, are uninterpreted facts, facts, objective facts. Facts are uh, primary. Uh, interpretation comes later. You know? 
understanding of these interpretation comes later. For Marxism, all history is the history is the, is the all facts make sense only in the context of class struggle. So the notion of class struggle comes first. That is the perspective in which all facts have to be accumulated and uh, interpreted, uh, so that uh, so that uh, in in one case facts come first, in the other case under, uh, understanding or interpretation comes first. But otherwise, the notion of an objective reality and a subjective perception of that reality that is common to both positivism and Marxism. Now that uh, that. Uh, and there is a permanent, particularly in Marxism, there is a permanent hierarchy of uh, causal explanations. You know, uh, you know I'll, in the end, uh, in in eighteen eighty eight, uh, five years after Marx's death, some Joseph Bloch uh, wrote to uh, Engels. You know, you both of you, Marx, and you have emphasized economy as the crucial element in understanding past, etc., etc., or present. Uh, aren't there other factors also important? You know, politics, for example, or philosophy, for example, or, or whatever, culture, for example. Aren't these also important in framing uh, your understanding of the past or the present? So Engels wrote back saying, a uh, very famous statement, uh, saying, Yes, all we emphasize these because this economy was being uh, uh, economy was being neglected, but uh, uh, of course other facts or other other aspects also are important. They also contribute. Politics contributes, philosophy contributes, understand culture, etc., etc. But he said, in the last instance, these are his words. In the last instance, it is the economy which matters. So there is a last instance structure of explanation you know? uh, all of these you know any event takes place uh, as a as an accumulative effect cumulative effect of many factors you know? uh, there is not one event particularly big events but any events uh, any event takes place with a with the with the, the with the as i said cumulative effect of many many things you know but uh, in the marxist analysis in all of this, the economy is the last instance. Uh, is the last instance explanation. You can count others, but economy is the last instance. In anal historiography, there is no last instance. You know. There is a moving conjuncture of hierarchy. You know. The hierarchy is a moving conjuncture, moving conjunctures of explanation. In one particular case economy may be, may be the most crucial in another case uh, culture may be more, more crucial in the third case politics may be may prove, prove to be more crucial etc etc so it's a moving conjecture each event each narration each event big event uh, is a accumulation of many factors but the factors keep changing the explanation of these factors keep changing it does not there is no such thing as a last instance which is a which is a very major sort of uh, departure that so uh, so uh, anal historiography introduces many elements into rankian scheme elements of imagination elements of culture elements of uh, multi vocality uh, uh, of explanation elements of uh, and and does a great deal of damage to the certitude that is inherent in uh, Rankian and uh, positives and Marxist schema. So that uh, we now, as a result, the scope of history expands enormously. Enormous. There is nothing that is beyond the scope of history. It's huge expansion. Of, uh, of of uh, the scope of everything, ecology, of course, apart from feminist history and, and so on and so forth, ecology comes in in a big way. Culture comes in a big way. The history of emotions, intangible things like emotions, history of families, family relations, and what we call, what they call history of everyday life. 
history of everyday life doesn't mean uh, you history of you got up in the morning and had a cup of tea and read newspaper and so on. History of everyday life means the tensions that occur in everyday life. In everyday life, there are tensions. There are tensions and harmonies. You know, life is full of harmony and tension. It's not either or. There is uh, in in any in any situation between the father and children, between the husband and the wife, between an employer and employee, between an institution and its workers, you know, between uh, uh, a political party and one political party and another political party, or within a political party, any anything, you know, there are both moments. There are both tension. It's a, an ensemble. Uh, of tensions and harmon harmonies, you know? uh, and there is a always a kind of moving balance. Every day uh, there would be moving balance. You see, uh, not a permanent tension, not a permanent harmony, but a moving balance. You know? Every day moving balance, and it is this everyday moving balance which leads to uh, very, very noticeable, very, very uh, enormous changes. Which changes, changes don't occur merely through revolutions, you know, in, like in Marxism. Changes don't occur merely through revolutions, uh, French Revolution and Russian Revolution and so on and so forth. Changes occur every day. And when they occur every day, the cumulative effect of these changes is also revolutionary. You know. Think of I mean, uh, think of just your own life 20, 20 years earlier, 50 years earlier, and certainly 100 years earlier, 200 years earlier. Changes are, have been taking place every day. So this is what they call the history of everyday life. Now, it changes the very notion of, it changes the very notion of revolution. It changes the very notion of change. You know, change doesn't occur only, change is not merely eruption, you know, like a revolution. Change is an everyday phenomenon, the cumulative effect of, of, of which occurs over long periods of time. You know. So that uh, they, uh, they, they, they greatly uh, annul historiography, and yet it is not as if it's abandoning fact. Facts still remain the basis of, uh, uh, of, of what we call facts. Facts still remain the basis of history that they are, they are writing. Uh, Finally, let me come to, uh, well, there is the, the from Anal, one moved on to uh, postmodernism. Postmodernism, <laughs> uh, one historian, Sir Geoffrey Elton, has called postmodernists, uh, what is he called? Uh, drug dealers. <laughs> drug dealers, which is a bit harsh on them. Uh, but there are all kinds of postmodernists, not one kind of postmodernist. But but I think uh, one uh, one change that postmodernism did make was that it it uh, it it uh, dealt the final blow to the notion of objectivity in history. That there is only one truth in history, which is which is implied in Rankian and Marxist uh, schema or positivism and, and Marxism. Uh, there is only one objective history, objective reality. That notion has been knocked out partly uh, to a large extent by Anal, but finally by, by postmodernism. That there are many, uh, many uh, truths in history as it were. Uh, and truth uh, Truth is not a single one. Truths, there are truths. What does it mean then? Your truth is equal to my truth. Your truth is yours. Mine is mine. They are all equal. No, it doesn't mean that. Their truth, their, 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 their multiple truths means that uh, each one's understanding or each notion or each theory or each proposition has a certain, uh, certain social significance. Uh, Anything, if you call medieval India, medieval period, if you call it Muslim period, there, there is, is neither of, of this is a true or false. 
that it was medieval is not true or not false that it was muslim that is not true or false it depends on what what meaning we are putting into that that truth for me medieval is the truth for x for james mill muslim is the truth but each has a different meaning for society it has different results for society if it, it has each has a different impact in, on society you know so that the 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 meaning of uh, uh, of uh, truths is not plural truths is not plurality is not uh, equal equality of all of, of all the meaning is that you have to go into further into the meaning of these the social impact of these the social force that it commands you know uh, that that is that is what uh, takes us to the real meaning of history but finally let me conclude by saying that you know we are uh, ranke had called ranke and his followers had called their history scientific history scientific history is still a term being used all the time you know? uh, scientific history actually it was not scientific at all but they called it scientific you know? i mean so, somehow there is a kind of there is a kind of uh, up, upgradation of your status if you call your form of knowledge science you know <laughs> so so uh, uh, so anyway uh, but uh, now we are entering into an era arena of scientific history real scientific history you know? the the uh, notion there is a delightful book recently published by uh, by uh, indicates to us where the climate of history it's a very clever title the climate of history in a planetary age is is he's talking of when he says climate of history he's talking of new directions in which history is taking us you know uh, that's what he means by climate but that's not the only thing he means by climate of history he means that now we are going to write the history of climate you know not of not merely of uh, you know earlier for example uh, uh, the uh, rainfall was rainfall was traced uh, mapped through cutting of the uh, of the trees when you when you cut a tree uh, uh, with a not with a not with a, an axe but with a you know blade Uh, not shaving blade, but you know, <laughs> uh, you will find that there are many air, many uh, rings in that uh, stem of the uh, stem of the tree. The the many uh, many colored, many colored, and many thickness, varying thickness, varying colors, and varying thickness of of uh, of uh, rings. Now, each the thickness and color of each ring tells you. how much rainfall there was in that particular year you know, year can be found out you know now uh, this is called dendrochronology it's also called chronodendrology that's how the frenchies began uh, in the 70s and 80s you know from there the history of ecology began but now today we are talking of the history of the whole climate you know every all inclusive climate so the climate of history also means the history of the climate that you are that we are writing and in a planetary age we are going to write the history of the planet not world history the history of china and japan and india and europe and uh, and greece and so on history of the planet is going to be write to be written uh, entire sort of single entity the planet uh, is being written and the this is for the first time true science is being used to unearth the history of the climate and the history of the history of the uh, uh, of the of the planet and of, of climate to unearth to uh, to to scientific methods you know dna for the history of uh, humanity uh, is being used language uh, the history of language is be, the the linguistics is being used and for uh, uh for uh, the, the climate history, for the history of climate many many scientific uh, tools are which i don't understand uh, 
uh, but many many I, under, I do understand that they are totally scientific in the true scientific sense not in the sense of sociology or something in the true uh, uh, true scientific sense uh, uh, in the true sense in which science operates they are being used to unearth the history of the entire planet the history of the entire humankind not of different regions and so on and so forth but history of uh, history of virtually everything you know and in a very scientific manner and therefore let me conclude with a note of sadness that when things are happening such such marvelous things are happening in the world of science you know such great openings are taking place in the world of science in the world of history you know uh, around us we are being pushed back to what to to discuss how the muslims were op oppressing the hindus in medieval india how Aur Aur aurangzeb was converting hindus to islam how Al Al alauddin khilji was doing this this is what we are back to where james mill are or we are being forced back to where james mill had left us you know 200 years ago so that that is the sad part of it that instead of well some of us like dipesh chakwarty and many others I, i'm just talking of him because i just got a hold of his book but many others in the world are now doing history of climate and the history of the planet in manners which are far beyond my capacity to understand but it still excites me to say to to know that history is moving in such great directions such marvelous directions and therefore i feel saddened to see that we are being pushed by our regime back into that <laughs> hindu muslim uh, hindu muslim dichotomy well uh, thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you very much uh, for listening to an old teacher uh, who has nothing much to do so thank you very much thank you so much sir thank you so much it was such a delight to listen to you um and i am sure that um all of us must have learned uh and have understood how the history and the discipline is this discipline of history has evolved over time and um how the different important aspects uh, have come along as the discipline has progressed um it was very informative lecture we all hear you quite often uh these days online uh, and uh today was i think was a very special day for all of us and i must admit that this is the most appropriate start and beginning uh for a refresher for a refresher course uh in history so i i thank you again very much for kindly uh joining us in giving your time uh, to interact with us on such an important topic uh may i request uh, uh professor uh because i believe that this is uh, an inaugural address so ideally there should be no question answer session i i would be very happy to yeah yeah it uh, yeah. if anybody has any clarification okay so we'll take couple of questions uh because i i think i think that professor haban smoky also doesn't have much time but couple of questions are welcome uh if if anybody wants to ask question they can unmute and keep your questions short and brief uh so uh, may i ask a question yes although i am not a participant uh, yes, sir, yes, how, yes. Yeah. How, how do we differentiate between historians and history uh, <laughs> the uh, the point which we raised that we should read history not the historians so how to differentiate between history and history no. because what historians write we consider it as a history <laughs> no first i didn't say that we should not read historian we should read history that was that was uh, leopold von ranke saying you know uh, just collect facts of history and they'll tell you history will tell you etc etc it's it not my statement i was in yeah. fact saying that you should understand and this is what anal historian taught us but even if the anal historians hadn't taught us you should understand the meaning of 
what each historian is conveying to you. you know? Each historian is conveying to you different meaning, and you are get, getting uh, of of his narration of his uh, recapitulation of events or or history. So you should understand that under meaning of that he or she is trying to convey. So you know. So I, I wasn't. So how do you differentiate between history and historian? No, you don't differentiate between history and historian. You understand history only through understanding the historian, what the historian is trying to convey. In fact, uh, long ago, E. H. Carr had said, "History, history is uh, history is what historians tell us." You know. So <laughs> that's <laughs> so. Yes. Uh, any other question? If there are no other questions, just yeah, just. All right, all right. Um, okay, let let me ask you one question, uh, Professor Harvind Smukhia. Yeah. Um, and we, I was wondering, um, uh, as young scholars like uh, all the participants here, uh, one of the major problems that we encounter uh, while reading and writing about history is is how to avoid the anachronistic categories. And you yourself oh. has like have written in your. I was reading the other day your preface to the historians and historiography, and yes. you have mentioned that it was very difficult for you at that point in time to avoid the word ideology. Yes. And you have been the most ardent critique of these anachronistic binaries. I have read some of your pieces on communalism. You always put the word medieval modern within the quotes. Yes. So, I mean, uh, how how do you avoid? Falling into the trap of these anachronistic categories and get out of it safely. Uh, you know, uh, Ikram, it's a very, 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 very complex question. You know, it's not a simple question. It, it, you know, uh, the each each uh, category has to be placed placed in its own context, you know, its own time and context, and so on and so forth. So don't. Don't extra extrapolate uh, your own uh, categories into the past. That's a simple answer, but it's not a simple answer. And this is uh, this is uh, uh, an uh, uh, a, a question which uh, has remained unanswered, really, you know, unsolved, really. You know. Why? Why? While it is true that. You uh, uh, you cannot put your own categories, your own uh, your own uh, categories of understanding of 21st century into the 16th century. You know. uh, that dis that distorts the 16th, 16th century picture. Is yes, it does. But then you know when in the 21st century you are looking at the 16th century. Your own questions have arisen in the twenty-first century. You see, they haven't arisen in the sixteenth century, you know? uh, and therefore the questions that that you frame necessarily have a uh, Leopold. I'm sorry, not uh, Benedetto Croce, uh, the Italian sociologist, had made a very profound statement: "All history is contemporary history." He said, "What does it mean?" What it means is that whatever period of time, whatever theme of history, whatever region of history you are studying, you know, you are studying because it, it the questions that you are putting to it in on in ancient China or ancient India or, or medieval India, whatever, the questions that you are putting to it have arisen in your mind in your day, you see. And therefore, these questions uh, necessarily relate the past to the present, you see, and that's why in that it, it's that this is how he said uh, all history is contemporary history. You know, your your. On the other hand, uh, which is quite true, you know. I mean, if you are studying uh, Akbar Nama in the same manner as uh, Abu Fazl had written it with the same question, then there is no need to study it. You see, it's already there. You know, right. why are you studying it uh, <laughs> with your own questions? You know, but. Uh, then it's also true that uh, if you if you uh, if you interpolate your own uh, concepts and, and your own values and you, uh, your own categories into the past, the past gets distorted. You know? So I don't know. Uh, no, as I said, it remains unsolved. You know, uh, 
uh, but then the second uh, the interpolation part uh, it has a very very uh, as we can see, we are watching that uh, helplessly almost uh, mm -hmm. uh, has uh, we are we are watching it helplessly at uh, at the social media you know uh, everybody you know uh, everybody is, has is free to <laughs> say any damn thing about <laughs> any part of the past you know and 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 uh, it, uh, and uh, think of uh, you know, uh, things which are to totally, you impose things on the past, which are totally irrelevant to the past. You know? But it can be grossly misused, it is being grossly misused. But then that's not the solution, you can't avoid it. You know? So either way, I just said it's a very complex question, either way it becomes a very co co complex question. And historians so far have found no solution to it, no final solution to it. Uh, I... Uh, plead guilty of uh, not being able to, uh, not being able to. I mean, I can only explain the dilemma that is involved in this question. I I don't think uh, anybody has any uh, any resolution of it. There is that's where we stand. Well, uh, thank you. We should stop here. Uh, and uh, may I now request Dr. Tehsin Bilgrami, ma'am, uh, to give a vote of support. A very good morning to you all. I'm Dr. Tessin Bilgrami, Deputy Director in HRDC. Let me propose a vote of thanks. On behalf of UGC HRDC, I extend a really hearty vote of thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Anul Hassan Saab, who spared time, who spared time from, from his busiest schedule to grace this occasion. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank our distinguished speaker, Professor Harbans Mukhya, sir, for making an excellent uh, presentation and making this program a very interesting and meaningful. I thank Professor Danish Moyes, Head Department of History, and the co coordinator, Dr. Ikramulha, who had prepared the timetable very comprehensively. I, will, I would like to express my gratitude to all esteemed participants for uh, uh, for their choosing this for the presence in this uh, refresher course and choosing Manu to do their training program. Lastly, I want to wish you all, and I am sure that you will be having a very enriching uh, program for this two weeks. With these words, I'll end up now. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Uh, may I? Uh... Yes, sir. So you, I think, uh, 